Prime Day es el 16 y 17 de julio. Con las ofertas épicas exclusivas para miembros Prime, recibe el reconocimiento que tanto mereces. ¡Wow! Gracias. Ni siquiera preparé un discurso. <coughs> Quisiera agradecer a mi familia, que siempre necesita cosas. También a Sam, mi repartidor, por entregarme todas mis ofertas increíbles tan rápido. ¡Te adoro, Sam! ¡Mua! Compra ofertas en Electrónicos Hogar y más este Prime Day, del 16 al 17 de julio. It's indictment day for former President Trump, and everybody seems to be losing their mind over it. We got a little college basketball to talk, both women's and men's, interestingly enough. We need to explain ourselves, where we've been, what we've been doing, what's getting ready to happen, especially with this program and other things. We'll talk about that. Also, want to talk a little Appalachia today, uh, coming off a policy conference I attended and a lot of the writing I'm doing. All that. Busy day. Missed y'all. Glad to be back. We're going to do some hard tell right after this. With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Herd Tell. Uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. I'm Andrew Donaldson. I have missed you. We haven't done a show in a while. We'll get to that a little bit later. We'll do a little bit of housekeeping. But let's start with the news of the day. You may have heard tell that former President Trump is being indicted. Now, here's the thing with this. This has all been very carefully choreographed and planned ahead, and it has to be. They haven't done this before, as you can tell by the news media saying the words historic and unprecedented roughly two times in every sentence they've uttered in the last couple of days when covering this story. But they have to plan this out. You have a former president. You have somebody who has Secret Service protection. You have a major celebrity, probably one of the most famous people in the world, so you'd have to do security anyway. There's negotiations. You don't want a scene. You don't want to put the Secret Service in a bad spot. This has to be done in New York City, in Manhattan. The logistics of doing anything there is complicated. There's a lot of moving parts to this. Plus, it's Trump. Plus, we know that things can get out of hand when people get all head up about political things. We saw what happened on things like January 6th. And I don't think anybody's going to do that because nobody except the real wackadoos of the world ever want to repeat that. I think the protests will be rather muted. We'll see what happens. However, yes, this is all stage spectacle because it has to be. And yes, this is different than any other criminal prosecution because it has to be. Now, let's stop right here and pause because here's what we're not going to talk about. I'm not going to opine on the indictment or the charges themselves because I haven't read them. I know this is revolutionary, but until you actually read the charges, no, you don't know what's in there. No, you don't know what's going on legally. I have some suspicions. I have some probably pretty good educated guesses on where some of this is going to go. But we're not going to talk about it until we've read it for yourself, because that's what we do. We're going to put it on the front page of Ordinary Dash Times when it becomes available. Read it for yourself. And then we'll talk about it. Until then, it's all speculation. Now, I understand there's political stuff. We can examine the background of the players involved. We could do all that. But let's start with the media angle on all of this, because here's what's been happening. The travel of former President Trump to New York City got the full Ginsburg treatment. If you're not familiar with the term, that usually means on the Sunday shows, you do all four Sunday shows at the same day for the same topic. That's when something's supposed to be really important, although that's lost a lot of relevance. All the networks were covering this. Everybody was following it as if it was the O.J. Bronco chase. They were following the plane. Listen, folks, there's no reason to follow this. We know exactly what's going to happen. We know exactly where he's going. We know the courtroom he's going in. We know the judge he's going to be. The only two things we really don't know is how much of this indictment we're going to get our hands on and when, hopefully is sooner rather than later, because I'd like to put an end to a lot of the speculation we can get on with this. And the other thing is whether or not there's going to be any kind of a gag order or supplemental instructions from the judge until he comes back. And then Former President Trump's going to get on his plane, he's going to go back to Florida, and we're all going to listen to Talking Heads talk about this for months on end because it's going to be a long, long time before anything legally happens with this case. Not to mention all the other cases that may or may not come down now that this one's started. Plus, we're in the middle of the election cycle, which former President Trump has already declared for. A lot of moving parts, but there's not any breaking news here. We know all of this except for those two little items, and they'll come out. You'll know. They'll pop up all over your social media the second they have 
happen. So there's really no reason to sit on top of this. There's no reason to really worry about it. There's no reason to get all head up on it. What we have here is another example of our news media being completely addicted to Donald Trump. For and against, Donald Trump has been the biggest boon to the news media business in the last, I don't know how long you want to go back, probably the maybe the Clinton era, the Lewinsky stuff, but that was a different era because we didn't really have the internet the way we have it now, certainly didn't have social media, and the network news media was far more powerful than what it is now. He's good for business. They're addicted to the ratings that they got during the Trump era, and they want it more of it. It's kind of like an addiction. The problem is they're needing more and more product to get the same old hit, but they get less and less of a high off it. So we have to have more unprecedented, more historic. I'm not talking about just the legal claims here again. Listen, we didn't read the indictment yet. We're going to reserve judgment. We'll read the indictment when it comes down and see what happens with it. I got a suspicion what's in it, but we'll see. But what we can see clearly is the news media and Donald Trump and his supporters are symbiotic beings. They need each other. They like the attention each other gives. They like the ratings each other gives. They like the fundraising each other gives if you're on the Trump side because he's already been planning. It's been widely reported. He's going to go back to Mar-a-Lago. He's going to have a big speech, and he's going to immediately fundraise off this like he did with his uh, way-too-early announcement that he was going to get arrested, which is probably why he did it. It's all fundraising. It's all more media stuff. Again, this is a campaign. Doing this has completely sucked all the oxygen out of the GOP pseudo-primary that we're in right now of who's getting in, who's going to run, who's doing what, because all the other candidates, all they can do is talk about Trump's indictment now. There's no oxygen for any of them to do anything right now. So a lot of people want this to happen. A lot of people are going to enjoy this happening. I don't enjoy this one little bit. It's bad for the country. It's bad for the judicial system. It's been very, very interesting watching people talk about what's fair and unfair in the judicial system all of a sudden just because it involves a former president that they either like or really don't like one or the other. Both sides are saying this is unfair for very different reasons. Folks, if this is your first instance on prosecutorial discretion, if this is your first instance on how messed up the system that we have to get people into the legal system when it comes to things like arraignments and bails and hearings and how certain people are treated differently. Welcome to the party, pal. This stuff's been going on for a long time. So if you're a Trump supporter going prosecutor misconduct, prosecutors overcharge people all the time. It's part of the game. Welcome to the criminal justice system. We would welcome you in helping us try to reform that because absolutely there's things like prosecutorial misconduct that needs to be reined in. For the people that are anti-Trump, they're just giddy that he's getting charged with something. No, he still gets the full benefit of the law. No matter how much other stuff he's done, you got to charge him with this and stick to what he's charged with here, not everything else. You can parse this stuff out. Do we think Donald Trump is unethical? Oh, absolutely. Has he probably broken some laws? Probably, but you still got a charge within the law. You still have to play the game. You still have to play within the rules. And in fact, this goes to the very, very core of the Trump era of U.S. politics. We've got years and years of book on Donald Trump as a public figure. His core thing is everybody else is as corrupt as I am, so therefore I can get away with it, and you need me to fight all the corruption. That was his pitch in 2016. And you know what? We've mostly proven him right. Everybody is just as corrupt as him, in a lot of people's viewpoint. So if you want to get him, you're going to have to do it quicker and cleaner than anybody else. That's just the facts of it. Fairness has nothing to do with it. Fair is what you pay the bus driver. Fair is where you go to ride the rods. This is politics and justice and a whole lot of power and a whole lot of money involved. You want to get it done, you're going to have to do it clean. You're going to have to do it with people who are clean enough to get the dirty guy. And so far, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of those out there. Donald Trump's reasoning that everybody's corrupt and I'm the corrupt tool for the system, that resonates with a lot of people because there's quite a bit of truth to it. The problem is, just because... He's corrupt, and the system's corrupt doesn't justify any of his corruption. Any crimes that they charge him with that he gets convicted by a court of law should be upheld. We should have law and order. We're going to have a hard time getting it here. So we'll see what's in this indictment when it comes out. We're going to post it in its entirety in PDF form on ordinary-times.com like we always do. We're going to read it for ourselves, and then we'll comment on the legal aspects of this. 
We can talk about the political aspects as far as the primary goes. But mostly today is stuff you already know what's going to happen and you don't need to sit and watch the networks follow him all over New York. There's no news here. And anything that does become newsworthy, you're going to find about in due course. So don't just sit and watch this all day. Take a walk. Do something productive. Because this is going to be way more noise and way more smoke than fire today. And we're going to be talking about this case for months and months to come. This isn't going to trial anytime soon. So settle in, folks. Keep your bearing. Don't lose it. And keep the perspective that this is the first step of many more steps of an increasingly loud story of former President Donald J. Trump in the legal system. On top of an election, just buckle up. We're going to be doing this for pretty much the rest all the way through 2024's election. More hotel right after this. Prime Day es el 16 y 17 de julio. Con las ofertas épicas exclusivas para miembros Prime, recibe el reconocimiento que tanto mereces. Wow, gracias. Ni siquiera preparé un discurso. <coughs> Quisiera agradecer a mi familia, que siempre necesita cosas. También a Sam, mi repartidor, por entregarme todas mis ofertas increíbles tan rápido. Te adoro, Sam. ¡Mua! Compra ofertas en Electrónicos Hogar y más este Prime Day, del 16 al 17 de julio. How long about to hurt? Tell him, Andrew Donaldson. Okay, let's talk a little women's NCAA basketball. Don't think we've ever covered that on the show before, but we got to because it blew up all over social media and it broke through. Sometimes we talk sports on this program when they break through to the regular media news cycle, and this one certainly did. Let's just start with some raw numbers because people really got all twisted up right after the championship game. Let's just bring some perspective here. Women's basketball and women's sports in general has been growing in America. Uh, this is not accidental. When you go back and look through history a little bit, because of the freedom of our country, because of the way that we have programs to try to elevate women's sports, it's really paying dividends off. This is something that's new. Uh, this is something, as the father of daughters, I've kind of watched firsthand. My kids weren't big into sports, but they played some sports. But I also went to their sports teams for their schools and things like that. Women's sports now is very different from even 10, 15, 20 years ago. It's more athletic. It's very, very competitive. Uh, you can go and just Google amateur sports, secondary education sports, low college and college sports. It's been an explosion in women's sports, which is all a good thing. That's fantastic. But what has happened is it's also elevated things like the NCAA Women's Tournament. The game is faster. It's more athletic. It's way more physical. And hold that thought because we're going to get back to it in just a minute. But let's start with the raw numbers here for a second. For people not paying attention, for all the noise, for all the background about LSU and Iowa and the big personalities and Caitlin and Angel Reese and all these players, that drives ratings. Listen to this number. Uh, this is from SportsMediaWatch.com. I'm going to use these numbers from them. Uh, Sunday's audience for the championship game, that's LSU versus Iowa. Matcher exceeded every game of last year's NBA playoffs except the NBA Finals. Topped every major last Major League Baseball postseason game except for the World Series. Every NASCAR race since 2017, that includes the Daytona 500 each year. And every NHL game in more than 50 years. Only 11 college football games averaged a larger audience during the last season, including the playoff. The Rose Bowl had only significant more viewers at 10.19 million. The game between... Iowa and South Carolina, which was a semifinal game, was the largest NCAA basketball game, men's or women's, that ESPN has had in years. The LSU championship game did ridiculous numbers. Um, it did almost double last year's championship game. Why? 
It's not just because of the quality of basketball, but because of what drives sports in the first place. Big personalities, storylines. The thing that everybody got upset about over the taunting and all that with Angel Reese and Caitlin and Iowa and LSU, a bunch of people just jumped on that because they saw the clip. They don't know the whole backstory of that. The trash talk had been going on all throughout this tournament. It started with that South Carolina game, and then LSU came back. There's the media narrative over Caitlin Clark and how she's the you know female Steph Curry and all this, and she's a tremendous player. They're absolutely driving ratings to come see her play. So you have to have all that context to understand why there was trash talk, why there was backstory, and that's all really good for the sport. I know people wring their hands over sportsmanship and stuff like that, but when's the last time you really talked about women's college basketball? I know we've never covered it on this show in the almost two years we've been doing it. It's because it got compelling. The games were good. They were tight. They were very pleasing to watch if you're just a neutral who maybe hasn't watched the women's game in a long time. They're not plotting games. They're not just layup lines like the old stuck. They're athletic, and they're very, very physical. I wanted to come back to that point. As they've gotten more athletic, as they've gotten more physical, you're going to get more emotion in the game because you cannot physically exert in a game without getting emotional. I'm fine with trash talk. I'm even fine with a little bit of taunting. Yeah, you need to rein it in a little bit, but let's be honest here, folks. We praise some people for doing it you got to be even with this. If we love it when the NBA stars do it, and we beg the Major League Baseball stars to show some emotion at all because MLB needs to let the guys have a little bit of fun, we love the touchdown celebrations in the NFL. They've gone viral, and even the NFL has backed off and said, no, we need to let people celebrate, while still tamping down on the actual outright taunting. I'm fine with the trash talk. I'm fine with the taunting. And if you don't think there's cultural people just jamming this into whatever their priors are to try to make hay out of it, you're kidding yourself. Of course there's cultural stuff involved. Of course there's racial stuff involved. Of course there's a backstory involved. Of course there's a media narrative involved where one player got picked as the media narrative for this whole tournament and it drove the other players to greatness going, nope, I want to be her because she's now been dubbed the next big thing. That's what sports is about. Competition, big personalities, big egos, pressure, taunting, talking. Let them play a little bit. Let them taunt a little bit. Yeah, you want to keep a little bit of cap on it. You don't want it going out of hand. But if you're trying to grow a sport and you're trying to raise awareness and you want to hit big time numbers, which this tournament did and these two games did and the women's game did, and frankly put on a better show than some of the men's games, which have not been super competitive in a lot of ways, this is what you need, and it's working, and people are going to watch now. And the good news is, unlike the NBA, something that's really hurt the men's game, most of these big personality players are going to be back next year. So this story is going to continue. Long-form storytelling in sports narratives is gold in the ratings, and it's gold in people talking. And the benefit of all this women's sports, and sports in general. This is all really good stuff and positive stuff. Don't get in with the naysayers about who said what to who. I get it. I know it can be uncomfortable. See, here's the other part of this, too. The LSU players and South Carolina had the same thing, too, here. When you do things differently, and you're physical, and you're loud, and you've got personality, that intimidates people. People who are not self-assured in themselves aren't real comfortable around big personalities. They're not comfortable around things that are different than them. They're not comfortable around things that aren't done the way they would do them. So instead of just accepting it or trying to work with it or going with it, they use that uncomfortability or their recoil to it to reverse into themselves. And then that's when your priors and your prejudices and your things that you're not comfortable with start coming out in bad ways. There's a lot of that going around with this story, too. Just enjoy the games. Let them taunt a little bit. Nobody got hurt here. They're all grown people. They're not porcelain dolls that need to be protected. If they talk smack to each other, they will all be okay and go on to live long, productive lives. Let them play. Let them enjoy the game. And a lot of you did. Over 10 million of you did. Sat and watched that game. 
It'll be interesting to watch going forward if this is a platform or an outlier. But I suspect, especially with the ratings, especially with media people who are always looking for the next big thing in live sports in a streaming world, where getting people to live TV is harder and harder, I suspect this is going to be a launching pad for women's sports. And that's an excellent thing. Something worthy of trashing, talking a little trash about. See, I can't even say it straight. I'm excited about it. When's the last time you were excited about sports? This is all good stuff. More hotel right after this. Back to Hertel, let's do some housekeeping. Where have we been and why haven't we been doing programs? Well, we put a little bit of this on social media, but not all of you are on Twitter or at Ordinary-Times.com, although you should be. Uh, So let's catch you up on a few things. We haven't been doing programs for a very simple reason. The show, as we've been doing at Hertel, where we do interviews, where we have in people to talk with us. To do that program, you have to be able to schedule it very strictly. You have to be available. You cannot blow appointments to do so. Um, The scheduling on a program to do a daily program with interviews and things like that, we obviously schedule that sometimes weeks ahead of time with certain people to get them in. And the production to do full video and audio and have folks in and put it all together. Uh, I'm a one-man band here. Uh, that takes a lot of time, takes a lot of effort. Uh, I'm also, frankly, <laughs> just to be completely honest, doing it uh, on equipment that wasn't designed to do video editing. So it takes a very long time to render stuff and get it uploaded. And we just can't do that with the current circumstances. So a couple things happened in the last month or so uh, that made us kind of pause her tell. Uh, first thing that happened was I had one of my children in the hospital for about three weeks uh, she's fine. Uh, we are over the mountain. I think of that with some light at the end of the tunnel, uh, going to be doing some further things with her, but she was inpatient for about three weeks, which means I was at the hospital along with her mother, uh, pretty much full time. Can't really, uh, do anything in there. Couldn't even take my laptop in there to work and the Wi-Fi was spotty anyway, but obviously you're not going to do shows under those circumstances. While that was going on, uh, I went, and this is the part we've already put on social media, so you can go find this if you haven't read it yet. I wrote a little uh, statement. We don't do press releases because I'm not important enough for that. But I did put it out there, what was going on. In the middle of this, I went for uh, an endoscopy with my surgeon. Uh, We had planned roughly on me having some pretty major surgery back in January, that we've been planning for several years, but neither him nor me got a warm fuzzy about it. We were kind of debating on what to do. So he's like, well, I'm going to do an endoscopy and we're going to go in and look at it. I want to see it for myself. What he found was not good. We had a bad report from that. Um, We knew the esophagus was shot, uh, so that wasn't a surprise. The fast-growing mass in my stomach that wasn't there the last time he looked in November, uh, that was a surprise and has to be dealt with. So I'm going to be going... Uh, on April the 17th for what's called a resectional biopsy. They're going to take a look at that. It's inside my stomach. It's about a three centimeter uh, mass, but this is all perfunctory. Uh, Regardless of those test results and how they come out, uh, that made the decision easy because we were debating on whether or not to, uh, you know, take the entire stomach and esophagus out or try this radical surgery they were halfway planning. That made it easy. Stomach's coming out, the esophagus is coming out, and anything else they find in there that ain't healthy, they'll take all that out too, and then they'll pull up some intestine, do a triple loop, and try to create me a new uh, GI system that hopefully works a little better than this one that doesn't work at all. So that's the long story short on that. Bad news on that is, instead of having surgery in January and being rehabbed and back to full strength by summer, looks like now I'm going to be probably doing surgery somewhere around May or June and spend the summer not particularly functional, but that's okay. So we've got a good surgery team. Uh, Although I'm a VA patient, they've outsourced this to Duke, to the doctors that took care of me in 2016, if you know my story. Uh, I have complete confidence in my medical team. My VA doctors, my primary care, and my mental health folks, they are exceptional. I, I know I bang on the VA, but I've actually got a really good team right now. 
I'm good with it. We are in get on with it mode. I'm ready to go. Let's go. Let's do this. I feel, um, interestingly enough, the last couple of weeks, I've mostly felt pretty good. Felt better than I have in a while, actually, which is interesting considering I'm more screwed up than I ever was. But I'm in a good place. I'm in a good mental place. I'm in a good physical place. Let's do it. Let's rehab it. Let's do this thing and get on about business. So, as far as her tell goes, this program, it's going to be a little spotty. We haven't done anything at all, but I went ahead and did this one because I want to, number one, just get back in the groove of it because I've missed you and I miss being productive. Number two is we want to have something out there for you folks. And number three is we're going to have to do this a little differently. So there's going to be a lot of shows where it's just me doing commentary, maybe not a lot of guests. We'll have some here and there as we can. We're also going to try to do a couple of specials, kind of the old school podcast where we take one subject, have some folks in, and really hammer it out. Uh, we're going to try to do some of those. Whenever the surgery stuff comes down, of course, everything's going to stop for a while. I've been doing more writing. We're going to talk about that in a minute when we do the Appalachian stuff. Uh, I've been writing a column for the Fayette Tribune. I've been focusing on West Virginia issues, things like that. I've been writing more for Ordinary Times. I'm also on Medium. Try to do some yonder and home stuff, food stuff, too. So the idea, while I'm rehabbing, I should be able to write. And there's a couple projects I want to work, work on that we're going to talk about in the Appalachian segment in just a minute. But that's the long story short on the housekeeping. That's why we've not been doing shows. That's why this one sounds a little different. That's why it's also going to be audio only for a while. Um, the video stuff... It, to do this same thing with video takes about three times as much time and effort. And it's not that you're not worth that. You are. It's just something we can't do right now. I don't have the time or the capability to do it right at this moment, so that's going to have to wait. However, all that stuff is archived. Uh, the YouTube channel, uh, iTunes, Spotify, wherever you listen to the podcast. We have a really deep archive now of Herd Tells. We've got 40-some-odd long form on specific topics. We have over 300 of the daily shows. I think it's almost the 400 now. There's a lot of stuff in there. We also have some breakouts of segments people asked for, things like that. Even a couple outtakes that are pretty funny, like when the cat jumped up behind me, things like that, that people like. So go dig through all those archives, share it with your friends, let people know that we're still here, and we will be back as soon as I'm able to do it. But in the meantime, we're going to do some of these. There's a lot of stories going on. We still want to talk about them. We want to turn down the noise of the news cycle because it's going to be noisy as all get out for the foreseeable future. And we're going to do as much work as we can because it's good for me. I missed you guys. It's good for you to know that we're still going to try to do what we do because you've been so supportive and I appreciate it. All right, that's enough feeling sorry for ourselves, enough housekeeping. Let's get back to work. More Hertel right after this. Folks, if you've listened to the Herd Tell program, you've heard our friend Gabriella Hoffman, but you need to make sure you're checking out her podcast, District of Conservation. It's a podcast exploring the nuances of true conservation efforts from D.C. and beyond. From topic discussions to exclusive interviews with conservation and energy newsmakers, Gabriella keeps listeners appraised of the latest news stories while elevating important voices. Listen to the District of Conservation on Apple Podcasts or wherever podcasts are played. Folks, you've heard of Ethan Brown on the Herd Tell Show a couple of different times, but if you're interested in learning about how to discuss things like climate change without all the politics and doom and gloom, head over to his podcast, The Sweaty Penguin. Sweaty Penguin is a late-night comedy-style climate podcast working to add nuance, critical thinking, humor, and hope to the climate conversation. they got over 100 episodes already, breaking down weekly news stories and specific topics from the vanilla to the ADHD to the international accountability to orangutan. Yes, I know, it's a comedy thing, so just go with it. But each time, exploring different ways we can make progress on these issues while still helping the economy, health, security, and everything else we care about. Feel overwhelmed, exhausted, or excluded by today's climate change discourse? This is the podcast for you. Find The Sweaty Penguin wherever you get your podcast or at www.thesweatypenguin.com. Ah, welcome back to Herd Tell. I'm Andrew Donaldson. Okay, let's talk a little Appalachia. Uh, I was privileged and very happy to attend the Appalachian Policy Summit at the American Enterprise Institute a couple weekends ago. Um, I'm not a big conference guy. It's just something I don't like to do. 
I'm kind of a homebody, really. I do like to travel and stuff, but I'm I'm not a conference person. I'm not, you know, the biggest networking person, although I've, I can do it and I've gotten better at it and I understand the need for it. But this was different. And uh, talking to the folks behind the scenes at AI who put this together, you know, Hunter and Emma and Josh and those guys, and great folks to work with, by the way. They really fed us good, too, if you watch my Twitter feed, which was funny because everybody was talking about the cookie. The cookies were amazing. But talking to them, they even talked about putting this conference together was different because they do lots of conferences and pressers and events at AEI. They said this one was different because every speaker they called about it, when they told them it was going to be an Appalachian thing, they were it wasn't negotiating or I'm going to come pitch my book. or it, Every single one of them told, oh, when do you want me there? Just tell me when to be there, when to show up. Uh, they competitively had some students from Appalachian colleges uh, compete. It was competitive. I think they took 29 of them total, something like that, were there, along with some of their professors. So you had policy folks, you had some commentators, you had uh, very, very high-end students from Appalachian colleges. You had their professors from those schools who actually did a breakout that I'm going to talk about in just a minute. Uh, and then, of course, you had the policy folks. And then in the middle of all this, you had little old me. Uh, it was really funny, actually, in the program because the panel I was on, they said, write a concise bio. Well, to me, concise bio was like two lines, and everybody else wrote like paragraphs. So you had like paragraph, 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 one line beside my picture, and it looked really funny on the paper. But, you know, I don't know. I've never done these before. It was my first, you know, my first time sitting in a tank and thinking and talking, heading in person and whatever. But it was a wonderful experience because it was around folks that actually cared to be there anybody that's done conferences or business meetings or whatever, when I was a manager, I hated meetings. I never had a meeting unless they made me have a meeting and then I made it as short as possible. I hate meetings. I don't like meetings. I don't like just sitting around talking about stuff. I'm going to go do stuff. But this was different. This was a very special conference because everybody there really, really cared. Uh, there was no dud speakers. Um, all the speakers were there and they were passionate about what they were talking about. And the people involved really were passionate about what they were talking about. And I got to meet some really amazing people. But it gave me some perspective on a couple things, and I wanted to share them about Appalachia. One is, uh, the running joke at the conference itself was people who say Appalachia and Appalachia. Uh, and it got to be so much thing that I started even messing up and switching between the two because you just hear it so much. Um, but Appalachia is an interesting place. And obviously, because West Virginia is the only state that's completely inside of Appalachia, although we we debated even the term Appalachia. What do you go off? Do you go off the, um, the ARC meaning, which is kind of, they expanded it into parts of Mississippi and Alabama and things like that. I go off the Appalachian Trail personally, uh, Maine to North Georgia and the Appalachian Trail. I think that's a good way to do it. But whatever your definition of Appalachia was, I brought this up on the panel that um, I got to speak on too. And I took this from another author. So this isn't originally to me, but Appalachia does not have unique problems. You know, deindustrialization, depopulation, uh, high death rates, low birth rates, aging populations, um, not enough uh, jobs, opioid crisis, uh, problems in the school system, underperforming schools, not enough college educated folks, not enough uh, blue collar jobs. All of these problems are not unique to Appalachia. You can find those in New York City, you can find them rurally. Um, one of the really good speakers was uh, comparing Appalachia and the Rust Belt and how parts of the Rust Belt have um, changed from industrialization to tech and other tech and healthcare and things like that and kind of revitalize themselves. Places like Pittsburgh, places like the Lehigh Valley, places like Minnesota where the Mayo Clinic and things like this. Um, there's lessons to learn there from other things. There's lessons to learn um, something that I've known for a long time because my dad told me about it from his experience all the way back in the 60s uh, when he spent a summer in Philadelphia in the inner city. He was driving around in a garbage truck, um, but he was there during a lot of the racial stuff in the late 60s in downtown Philadelphia, and he came back and he said, man, they got a lot of the same problems we have. There's just racial components involved in it. There's things inner cities and Appalachia can learn from each other because they got a lot of the similar problems with poverty, with government programming, things like this. Those things are all really important to learn that you don't learn unless you go to a setting like that where you get to sit and listen to it. But Appalachia does not have unique problems. What Appalachia has is unique people. Very unique people. Look, some of the stereotypes actually come from truth, although we recoil at them. We're unique. We're a different kind of folks, okay? 
uh, were not the only unique folks. Um, I thought I'd seen some hillbillies till the first time I went to northwest Arkansas up in the Ozarks, and my lord, some of y'all need to settle down. That's coming from somebody who's a hillbilly, okay? However, the unique people uh, make the problems unique. It's not unique problems, it's unique people. So all the answers to Appalachia's problems are going to have to be people-centered. And I've said it before, if you have policy that isn't people-centered, you just have tyranny and failure that's on paper waiting to be brought to life. So here's something I took from the Appalachian Policy Conference. The overwhelming attitude of it is not, oh, we need a bunch of government money to come in and fix this. It's not, we need another uh, big program or initiative to come in and fix this. The overwhelming attitude and this was almost exclusively people either in Appalachia or that studied Appalachia and have it as a as a you know specialty to understand it. Appalachia's got to fix this themselves. There ain't no help coming. Now there's things folks can do to help, but it's going to be on us. You need people-centered solutions. You need technologies that are people-centered and there's a lot of signs under all the problems. Under all those problems that I mentioned, the opioid crisis, poverty, the population, you know, West Virginia is, for all intents and purposes, the only state to lose population in post-World War II America. It's just shocking when you see the numbers. There's still hope underneath all that. There's things going on with technology, with social media, with education, with jobs, with things like remote work, with tourism, with the ability for folks to have a different kind of working lifestyle. There's a lot of hope for Appalachia if we seize the moment and focus the answers on people, not just on the poverty and not just on the problems, but on people. What kind of people can we attract? What kind of people can we bring back? What kind of people can we keep if we can get them here? When things like Appalachia come up, I always try to write about it from a people and cultural perspective, even if I'm talking about a political or policy thing. Um, This is why I started writing with the Fayette Tribune, a local paper uh, back home in West Virginia. I want to write about these issues. Journalism, West Virginia, one thing about West Virginia, if you don't know, they've always had journalism that's punched way above their weight. Okay, The Charleston Gazette has a Pulitzer recently, within the last 10 years. Uh, when you go into WCHS, the banner on my Twitter feed is me at WCHS Radio. That's the radio station I grew up with, the talk radio station. Uh, me and my, my buddy Dale Cooper, Coop, uh, who's one of the upper-ups there. That's my header on Twitter because that's one of the, that was one of the biggest deals for me. Look, I've done Fox News. I've done overseas media. I've done um, Times Radio. I've done some really cool stuff. I've done Young Turks. I've done some interesting media stuff. Nothing cranked me up like WCHS because that's the radio station I grew up listening to. Um, so when you go into WCHS and you're waiting, though, you see all the Marconi Awards and you see the Morrow Awards. You know, West Virginia's always had great press, but their press is in danger right now. Um, we have saw, you know, the core young group at the Charleston Gazette, the paper record for the state, all getting fired for rightfully protesting something that the owner of the paper did, one of the owners, who's also the minority leader in the you, the state senate you can see the conflicts of interest there you can see public radio firing a reporter for you know criticizing the governor and the head of the public ra- broadcasting in West Virginia now is the former spokesman of that same governor you can see the problems West Virginia needs good media and they need their original voices to be brought up so that's one of the reasons I started writing locally again although I've done more national stuff it's filling and it's needed and it brings a little bit of attention. But every time I write, whether I'm writing about the West Virginia State Police or poverty or the opioid crisis or whatever, I try to get it back to people focused because the solutions in Appalachia and West Virginia is the same problems and the same solutions of wherever you and yours are, wherever you are in the world. It's going to be a people solution. Can you unleash the power of people? Can you unleash the potential of people? Can you raise people up in a way that they can turn around and raise other people up? Those things start compounding, and that's how you get real change. It's not just dumping money into the system. That doesn't work. If it did, the war on poverty would have been won 60 years ago when they started it, and we wouldn't be any closer than we are now. You're not just going to win at throwing money at things. You can, however, target 
people-focused stuff, and that's what's needed in West Virginia. They need to do some infrastructure stuff. The broadband thing's huge. Getting proper internet to the whole state so that the state can represent itself, can bring in businesses, can have access to the wider world, that is incredibly important, and there's ways to talk about that. There's some infrastructure and transportation stuff that needs to be done in West Virginia. And we need to get over some of our own. Look, I, I'm into accountability. West Virginians, I'm one of them. We got a little bit of problems with outsiders, and we're going to have to get over that a little bit. I know we're picky about our culture, but look, the West Virginia I grew up in is already gone because we grew up, you know, pre to early internet before social media. That culture's already gone. Culture's always changing. What we need is more West Virginians. I just wrote a column about this in the Fayette Tribune, and we'll link to it in the show notes. You need to go read it. What West Virginia needs is more West Virginians of all stripes. It doesn't have to be people I politically agree with. It doesn't have to be people that have the same lifestyle I have. It don't have to be people that are culturally anything like it. They may not worship God the same way I do. They may not worship a God at all. They may dress funny. They may talk funny. They may not understand all our customs. But if they're willing to come, we need to welcome them, put out the welcome mat, because we need more West Virginians. I don't want to be part of an extinct species, and we're an endangered species if you're a West Virginian demographically. Now, there's hope in there. The Hillbilly Highway has gone away. There's actually net migration. It's just the aging population against the very low birth rate and the almost non-existent immigration rate means that the net population is still dropping, but it's not people moving out. There's actually a net migration of people moving in. And if we can amplify that and we can work on the things the people that are moving there for, low cost of living, different kind of lifestyle, but they like the natural beauty. Just had a friend of mine visit the state for the first time on Twitter, and I was like, what would you think? First words, they always, man, I didn't, it's so beautiful. I'm like, I told you. They're like, I know, but I didn't realize it until I saw it. It's one of the most beautiful places on earth, and I've been everywhere. It's one of the most special places on earth, and I've been everywhere, and it's got some special people. People need to move a little bit. They need to modernize just a little bit. They can do it without losing who they are and get more people into West Virginia. And that extrapolates out to greater Appalachia as well. Appalachia is going to have to change. You see the regions that are changing are starting to thrive. And the ones that don't change are going more and more down into the dustbin where there's not a whole lot of hope to get back out. A little bit of change is good, folks, and we can all do it. Being at that policy conference gave me a lot of hope. I'm going to have a couple projects, especially with things like higher education and the opioid crisis and things like that coming out. But I am full of hope that there's people who care, that there are solutions that are obtainable. And the best part, a lot of those aren't even going to require a vote or a politician or a legislature or a governor. It's stuff we can do ourselves with our social media, with our own representation, taking ownership of being West Virginians or Appalachians or whoever you are, wherever you are. You can take ownership of it now and do a whole lot of good with the tools you already have in your hand. If you're listening to this program, that means you have a computer or a cell phone or something, and you probably have social media. Start using it to advocate for your own folks in your own area in a positive way. That's the little ways you start getting some real good change. More Herd Tell right after this. Welcome back to Herd Tell. Let's end on a good note. Let's go over to London. This is from the goodnewsnetwork.org. Cool site, by the way. Just get you some good news on your timeline a little bit. Uh, let's go over to London. The National Health Service is something we've actually been critical on this program, but this is a cool story. Paramedic twins, whose dad died of a cardiac arrest 21 years ago, saved a man suffering the same condition in a tag team effort only a day after the anniversary of his death. Angie Mills and her brother Steve Mills were only working together by chance during a rare joint shift as part of the same ambulance crew when they resuscitated the patient who his heart had stopped beating for almost five minutes. Steve works for the London Ambulance Service as an EMT, but Angie is a 999 call handler. uh, That's the 911 version for the National Health System over in London, by the way, 999. So the pair are not usually part of the same team, but they were out in the same ambulance earlier this month when Angie decided to shadow a frontline crew for the day, the Twins, 
from southeast London were initially called to a man who had fallen, but soon after arriving, both had to jump into action to save his life. Angie, who had previously only instructed callers to do chest compressions over the phone, started CPR while Steve and his crewmate Paul focused on giving the patient oxygen. Thanks to their quick thinking, the man was revived and began talking again despite having no heartbeat for almost five minutes. Quote, I never needed to resuscitate someone myself, said Angie. It wasn't until we were driving to the hospital that I reflected on what I had just done. I started thinking about how things can change so quickly and in a matter of minutes. You can switch between life, death, and again life. The incidents felt particularly close to home for the twins who lost their dad, Hugh Mills, to a cardiac arrest when he was just 61. Similar age to the man they had brought back to life. Because he was of a similar age to our dad when he passed away, it brought back powerful memories, said Angie. Of course, having my brother there did as well. I thought about the fact that my dad didn't get to enjoy retirement. He passed away before Angie and Steve had both joined the ambulance service. At the time, Angie was working in a bank and Steve was a builder. The 51-year-old brother recalls, quote, When the paramedics were with my dad, I was there the whole time and I couldn't help him. He received bystander CPR from a police officer, but unfortunately he still didn't make it. When I started my job, I always dreaded getting sent to cardiac arrest. I didn't know how I would cope with that type of job because of the way my dad had died. Angie and Steve both said they were saving a life together was an extraordinary achievement, which would make their dad proud. It feels even more special because I was doing it with Steve. My CPR was effective also because I felt so comfortable doing it next to my brother. And we are so close. Steve kept saying to me, you're doing a great job. The timing is perfect. The depth of the compressions is great. By the way, if you ever watch chest compressions on like Grays or something, it always cracks me up. If you're doing CPR correctly, you usually and sometimes quite often can break somebody's rib. you got to really hammer that thing. So anytime you see TV where they're just barely touching it, that's, that always cracks me up. But I digress. Back to the thing. As chest compressions were provided immediately, the patient could keep his brain supplied with blood, and that prevented, proved vital in him recovering so quickly once his heart had started beating again. By the way, if you don't know how to do chest compression CPR, go take a class. It'll save somebody's life or probably somebody that you love and care about. Just go do it. A lot of places it's free. Just go find one. Back to the piece. Angie pondered her own future after the meaningful event. Quote, it made me think about how precious life is and how I should enjoy it more. Take every opportunity that you've got. And don't put things off. It's a great story. It's from the Good News Network over in London. Good on them. We'll put the link in the show notes. Also, on a good note, uh, the news media is going to be completely uh, all Trump all the time. Do not forget the victims of these tornadoes over the past weekend uh, out in the Midwest. I know Little Rock got hit really hard. Iowa got hit really hard. Some other places, a place in Illinois where a theater collapsed on a metal show, and it's a mir- if you've ever been to a metal show in a theater setting, it's a miracle only one person died. Um, there was double digit deaths. There was a lot of people homeless. The Little Rock one hit really close to home. Little Rock was my first duty station prior to nine eleven. I was actually on the volunteer fire department in Gravel Ridge, Arkansas, one of the communities uh, that was under threat of tornado. Doesn't look like they got hit too terribly bad, but. Look, I still got my Pulaski County fire shirt hanging in the closet. That one hit close to home. I know a lot of those neighborhoods. They started talking about Cantor Drive, places like that. I know exactly where they're talking about. Um, Pray for those folks. Support them. There's plenty of good charities out there. Like we've always told you, though, when you go to give money, national organizations are well and good. Try to give money as close to the disaster as possible. Local organizations, local emergency services, local churches and religious organizations— those places usually get the money to the people faster, and they take a lot less overhead than something like the National Red Cross. Again, there's nothing wrong with it, but I would encourage you to find the closest people on the ground to the disaster to give money to, especially if you're national or international and want to help out. It'll also make sure the money gets to the right people as quickly as possible, and it doesn't get caught up in the bureaucracy of some of these large charities. So anyway, that's enough of that. Make sure you're helping each other. Make sure you're taking care of each other. Above all else, I cannot tell you how much uh, I appreciate all of you. We already touched on what's going on, so I won't belabor the point. But y'all mean a lot to me and my family and my friends and the circle of people I work with at Ordinary Times and Fayette Tribune and other places that I get to do stuff. Young Voices, um, super supportive. Uh, Folks, I just can't tell you how much you need to use your social media for good, because the people I've met on Twitter and doing these programs and in my writing, they mean so much to me now. I'm talking about you. You mean a lot to me. 
Uh, and you can have people in your life that means a lot to you too, because when the dark times come, you got people that support you, even if it's just a, a tweet or a direct message or a statement or something telling you, I'm telling you, when, when the sky's dark, those little points of light matter a lot. Make sure you're being that for the other people in your life. So I don't know when I'll do another one of these. I'm going to try to do them as often as I can. They're probably going to be audio only. So make sure you're subscribing iTunes, Spotify, all the platforms, and we'll talk to you again soon. So till we do this again, and hopefully get to keep doing it for as long as I'm able to, wherever you are across the street or around the world, we hope you're well. We hope you are well fed. We'll talk to you again as soon as we possibly can for more Herd Tell. Take care. All the music on her tell is provided under a creative content license from monstercat.com. Folks, if you've listened to the Herd Tell program, you've heard our friend Gabriella Hoffman, but you need to make sure you're checking out her podcast, District of Conservation. It's a podcast exploring the nuances of true conservation efforts from D.C. and beyond. From topic discussions to exclusive interviews with conservation and energy newsmakers, Gabriella keeps listeners appraised of the latest news stories while elevating important voices. Listen to the District of Conservation on Apple Podcasts or wherever podcasts are played. Religion is at the intersection of our 21st century life, even if we don't express a faith. At a time when it seems that religion isn't as prevalent as it once was, it still leaves its mark everywhere. As a pastor, I know that religion isn't something I just do on a Sunday, but it's found in every nook and cranny of my life. Sexuality, politics, social media, the economy, war, nationalism, all have some kind of religious angle to them. And as a communicator, I want to find the stories that can help people understand this part of our society that is so important to so many. Hi, I'm Dennis Sanders, and I'm the host of Church and Maine. Church in Maine is a podcast about the journey of faith and where it intersects with modern life. I look at faith with a journalist's eye, asking the who, where, what, why, and how religion affects some of the major issues of the day. Join me as we journey together. You can listen to Church in Maine podcasts at the website churchinmaine.org or on your favorite podcast app. I look forward to seeing you. Prime Day es el 16 y 17 de julio. Con las ofertas épicas exclusivas para miembros Prime, recibe el reconocimiento que tanto mereces. Wow, gracias. Ni siquiera preparé un discurso. <coughs> Quisiera agradecer a mi familia, que siempre necesita cosas. También a Sam, mi repartidor, por entregarme todas mis ofertas increíbles tan rápido. Te adoro, Sam. ¡Mua! Compra ofertas en electrónicos, hogar y más este Prime Day, del 16 al 17 de julio.